Well, Maureen, we're, hey, we're in the field and we're next to this building and I, you've been the person that's had to look at this for a long time. That's right. Um, we moved into St. Joseph's behind us in the 1980s and we were very keen to research the history of the house. We also wondered what on earth this old brick thing was as well. We had been told that the military had had St. Joseph's in the war and we wrote to the RAF um, archives and they said no, no record at all. So we forgot that bit and uh, completely ignored that. And um, But all the local stories said that yes, this was connected with World War Two. You had a, didn't you have some sort of visit from a stranger? We did. Um, one summer's day, quite like today, there was a knock on the front door and a man appeared and he said, I think you want to know about what that brick thing is in the field. So we said, yeah, come in, have a coffee. And so he came in and he produced a piece of paper with a diagram on. And he talked us through this diagram about beams coming from Germany and how this station here distorted those beams and made the German bombers lose their direction. Well, we were quite fascinated, but to be honest, it was a bit over our heads. And we said, thank you very much. And the work and children and whatnot, it got forgotten and the bit of paper was filed away. And here we have that document, a page from the month by month record of some sort of RAF activity in World War Two. Yes, and down on the left is an entry for Colville. And we later learned that this referred to the field that we're now standing in. And look at the date. Opened on the 25th of November 1940. And I see over here are some more dates very soon after. They refer to the equipment installed here soon after the opening. It was vital equipment too. That was only a couple of weeks after the terrible raid on Coventry. It all ties in with what was happening next door at St Joseph's Cottage. Have a look at this. Well, what do we have here? Well, in the early part of World War II, the tenant of St Joseph's Cottage took in paying guests. Look closely at these entries for the end of 1940 and early 1941. Oh, they're all RAF. And just after the 25th of November opening date. Seems like they came here to start something up. Mm. By this time, Charlie Heritage Group was flourishing and we got some new members, um, several of whom were really interested in World War II. Michael Froggett gave us a talk about the beam benders using um, R.V. Jones's book as his source. And it was absolutely fascinating. And that started the whole research up again. What research you did after hearing Michael Foggart's talk? Well, we went back to Ken Nichols. I'd found out who this stranger was by that time. And we went back to Ken, who lived in Col still lives in Colville, and talked to him. And we got lots of interviews on film and on tape. And we got the whole story from him. It was fascinating. Well, wow, that sounds a fantastic story. This is our star witness, Ken Nichols, in a photograph taken in 2009. Ken volunteered for aircrew first, but an ear problem saw him steered into training as a wireless mechanic, which he did at Bolton College. When he came to the Colville outstation in 1941, he looked like this in his uniform. He told us how the site was laid out in his own words. Now just here, just here, they, there, was a, there was another transmitter there, there's another one up here, and there's another one that says there's three transmitters there, and then there's that one there, which was the, was the last one to arrive. So when I got there, there's three transmitters, one, two, three. No, not in big structures, no, no, they, in they were just in, in sheds, in sheds. In sheds. And there was a, a cabin there, a cabin building, which was a headquarters. Finding all this out from Ken Nichols as a star witness must have been extremely exciting for the group. But what happened next? Well, it's quite fascinating because you got involved there as well. And you wanted everything that we'd got on World War II brought out of the archives, our own archives. 
and collated. And from that came our book, World War II in Charlie, which you edited from all the evidence we'd got. And then we held a Heritage Open Day under the national scheme in 2012 and another one in 2013. They were extremely well attended. So this whole Very field good. was full of activity. Yet we recreated the site as far as we could. It gives me great pleasure in declaring this event open. With the day properly opened by the 92-year-old Ken Nichols, his cadet guard of honour led him across the field to the big tent in the centre of the site. This was in the location of the stores and headquarters shed of the World War II outstation. Today it houses the main six-panel exhibition telling the story of the Battle of the Beam. Are you right? Smile to me. That's right, yeah. Are you going to show me On to the tent at the Aspirin Shed location. Outside was a panel explaining the Nicobine system and how the Aspirin transmitter dealt with it. Inside was the vital telephone link to the 80 wing control room with some notes on which transmitters to switch on and their frequency settings. Ken Nichols and his granddaughter on their way to the nearby World War II location of a bromide transmitter. This dealt with the Luftwaffe x beam system codenamed the Ruffians. The tent here is the base for 1188 Squadron of the Air Training Corps. The squadron have decided that they wanted to come in World War II uniform as close as they could from our stores, bits and pieces. Um, they've borrowed RAF cap badges from RAF Wittering, which they've got to return. Um, and at the moment they're, they're going to play radio battleships, which means they will go out with mobile radios, call in a, a call sign, select a square, and then be told whether their aircraft is in danger on the in-run or danger on the out-run um, and it, it's basically battleships by another name. So, and are you doing, are you, train, are you working as a radio station this weekend at all? Yes, the, the, we've got um, the, uh, the air cadet um, stations around the country are listening for our call sign and we're monitoring theirs. So we've been set up um, as active this weekend so that people can contact us and get to know what we're doing. You get the instructions to fly in on the radio. You will give the grid reference to where you want to fly in, the grid reference for where you want to drop the bomb, and the grid reference for where you fly out again. So, somebody tell me, if you were to fly in here, drop the bomb there, and fly out there, what would you give good references? Uniform Bravo. Yeah. Uniform. That one. Uniform India. Yeah. And. Uh, Indian. Uniform. Oh, yeah, Mike Pepper. Mike Pepper. Okay, I think you've got the idea. Yeah. It's easy. If you're looking at your sheets, it's easier to read off that. Oh, like I can tell you what's around the outside. And so on to the second bromide location, now peopled by the Loughborough Amateur Radio Group. To the Charlie Hotel Golf. The signals aren't as good as they could be, I think. But we're endeavouring anyway, and uh, we're getting several stations um, Scotland, uh, Ukraine, uh, right up into uh, almost Alaska, all very, very 
uh, distant stations. So yeah, we're persevering. It could be better, but. Uh, What's your role? Well, I'm normally the guy who shoots arrows over trees. Um, up till today, I've had quite a lot of success, success, but today has been one of those days, it's a jinx day, and um, I've lost three arrows. Uh, we're the Upper and District Amateur Radio Club, and today we're going to erect some antennas. But to do that, we need to shoot a cord across the, quite a high tree just here and uh, attach the antenna to the end of it. Another one. <laughs> the radio club needed a high antenna so they could reach the world from their special amateur radio station in the bromide tent. Their ingenious solution relied upon using old-fashioned archery skills and the high branches of a Scots pine tree at the edge of the field. The operation meant taking over the Oaks Road for a while as the launch pad for the arrows. Walkie talkie radio had to be used to warn members on the other side that an arrow was coming over. Success was not achieved however and two arrows were lost. A more conventional antenna system was rigged up using poles. From this tent our simulation challenge was answered. Brian Goodall of the Radio Club worked up a way of showing visitors just what flying down a German target beam was like. Using radio was impracticable and probably illegal, so he set up beams carrying the dots and dashes using the infrared spectrum. Very easily um, to go for an infrared beam system. Um, no license required. Um, it can be focused into a very narrow beam much, much easier than radio, and um, it seemed to be the way to go. And uh, I think that in seven days of meeting you at your talk at the radio, club, um, I got the system working. All right, it was only 10 metres, but it was a working system. So the decision really to increase the power and again increase the range, increase the sensitivity of the, um, of the receiver and hopefully get about 100 metres. And these are the projectors that we can see behind you? They are, yes. And how have you got in your hand? Well, um, I've got two receivers, but this one um, it's a, a very poor excuse for a model of a, a German bomber. But basically, it contains the receiver system of the sensor in the tail, basically taking the signal from the two beams. It also has a small UHF transmitter in the in the nose. Now, that was put in really because trying to run a headphone amplifier off this had also technical problems, so it was easier to transmit the signal from this to a separate receiver. And, um, and the separate receiver is worn by the pilot? Yes, well, yes, the idea is that you uh, have this over your head. Um, it's got the option for headphone use if you, if you wish. Um, and basically, uh, uh, okay, so it's picking up the signal at the moment on the dash side. And if I move across,
David Fitchett set up a stall to give parents and children a go at friendly competition. Who could fold a piece of paper and send it more than 50 feet? Yes, I think that's our one. Okay, Michael, bend it over. Can you press it, Michael? Please. Yeah. 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 In a bid to be authentic, we had this well-used military radio trailer, still in its K4 camouflage colours when used by the NATO Kosovo force. It was soon transformed into a more RAF looking trailer with a mobile paint sprayer before taking up its place in the World War II blast walls. On the open day, this info board was placed outside telling the story of the Weigarat beam Benito and how it was overcome by the Benjamin transmitters inside. Wireless mechanic SAC Froggart arrived on shift on his bike leaving it against the wall. On the day he was soon joined by a squad of air cadets wanting to see inside his trailer. Great party then here. Yep. Have you any other final stories to round it off? Oh, there's a real tearjerker now. Um, when we talked to Ken, he told us that as a 19 year old, drinking his tea, leaning over the gate, they eyed up two young ladies cycling up the hill or pushing their bikes, it's quite a hill. And to cut a long story short, he married one of them. And that was really nice. They met under a cherry tree over there. When we did the DVD about World War II in Charlie, we recreated that scene, that meeting, um, with the students from Welbeck College. Uh, that, that's where I met my wife, incidentally. There used to be a cherry tree there, which used to have lovely cherries on, and there's a gate there, and it was, I don't know, it was in, in mid-afternoon, and... I was leaning over the gate talking to a friend of mine and we both got a mug of tea, me with the number six on it, and walking up here, which as you know is a fairly steepish hill, was two young girls, you see, and one of them was my wife and we had a chat. Well, she, she'd been to see a... She, she'd pushing a bike, she wasn't walking. Oh, no. Well, yeah. she was walking, but yeah. pushing a bike because it was steep, you see. She'd been over to Shepshed to see her aunt actually and mm -hmm. lived in Shepshed with Gold another girl and she's going back to well she's going back to Ellistown where she lived now. I don't know, we had a chat and the, there was there was a dance coming off at the somewhere and I said, Would you like to come to the dance with me? you see? So she says yes. So he arranged so, to meet at this dance. The wedding took place locally. Uh, I believe it was on the sixth of August nineteen forty five. At Ellistown. At yeah. Ellistown, the day that the, the, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Mm. So he couldn't go to Japan as, as was threatened. Coincidences, aren't they strange? Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. That's the story of this site. Do we know anything about any other sites? Because there were more, weren't there? There were lots of beambender sites, as well, beambender as we call them, but it's been hard to locate them. Um, the records at Kew aren't complete about them at all. But they don't give the coordinates, and lots of them now have been built on and are just lost. But some have been detailed. And at Munsley in Norfolk, we met a 97-year-old lady who is the widow of a World War II RAF 80-wing man. And she talked to us about her site, her husband's site. This is Mundersley on the Norfolk coast, the site of an 80-wing outstation. A visit here came about through an article in the Norfolk Journal of Industrial Archaeology. It described a local exhibition held in 2006 featuring the outstation. 
The station was an ad hoc affair in a field with hastily erected sheds. The red circle on the map shows its position one field away from the cliff edge and the North Sea, adjoining to the road to Cromer. This is the entrance to the Mundersley outstation field. There was a building here in World War II doubling as guardhouse and headquarters for the site. In 2013 it was showing this splendid wheat crop but in World War II it would have been down to grass pasture. Now imagine the field in 1941 with its transmitter sheds and at least one of these 150 foot high masts. The mast was pushing out spoof homing signals, the meekening tactic, to spoil the homeward journeys of Luftwaffe bombers. The masts were later used as part of the splasher system to help American air crews find their way back to Norfolk. That journal article carried this photograph of the staff at the outstation. Because the article said that it had been supplied by Phyllis Morris, it was possible to track her down in 2013. We learned from her about the romances that had blossomed at wartime dances held here in Mundersley's Coronation Hall. Local girls had much enjoyed the company of the boys in blue from the outstation. Widow Phyllis Morris, 92 in this 2013 photograph, told us of her marriage in 1945 to wireless mechanic Ron Morris from the outstation. Ron hailed from Rochdale and after the marriage he settled in Mundersley with Phyllis, developing a career with a local radio and TV retailer. A Jack Leng, another wireless mechanic from the outstation, married Mundersley girl Peggy Scott. Phyllis had no real idea of what her husband did at the outstation and was overjoyed when we presented her with our book telling the full story. Now to Templecombe in Somerset, near the Wiltshire border. We were able to pinpoint the outstation field site from the 1941 farm survey map of the area. The field marked out in pale red on this modern OS map was marked Air Ministry on the 1941 farm map. Templecombe is a small place nestling in a valley or coombe. In World War II it had an important junction of two railways which attracted a heavy raid in 1942 from the Luftwaffe. Several people were sadly killed and much damage was done. Temple in its name derives from the ancient association as a manor under the jurisdiction of the Knights Templar. The inn's name, the Templar's Retreat, preserves the connection. Although the RF wireless mechanics may well have met up off duty at the inn, their outstation was a mile up the hill facing towards the south in this field. It would have had the usual collection of sheds with transmitters. It also had at least one of those 150 foot high masts re-radiating out the German homing bing signals. The RAF operators here achieved fame by snaring the Heinkel that made the forced landing on Bidport Beach, as well as the Dornier that was put down on that runway at Lyd in Kent. So our curiosity has taken us to some of the 80 wing sites where we could identify the precise location Apart from Templecombe in Somerset, we journeyed to Mundersley and met wireless mechanic widow Phyllis Morris. And while in Norfolk, the Skoll site was discovered up the aptly named Dark Lane. Then all the way to Mask in North Yorkshire to brave the rain and see a ram making good use of an 80 wing hut. There is one place we must go to, Radlett in Hertfordshire. All World War II 80 wing activity was directed from two big houses in that village. Is it possible that they are still there? We have made our way to Radlett in Hertfordshire, a large village sitting astride the Roman Watling Street. In the 1930s there were a number of large mansions set in parklands. One was used as a hotel 
Alderman Lodge, which was the first to be requisitioned by the Royal Air Force as the headquarters for the new 80-wing signals unit. More space was needed and so this grand mansion, Newbury's, was commandeered. 80-wing set up its control room behind the bow window on this end of the building. And here is a diagram of that control room, the nerve centre of the operation. Large numbers of staff would have been needed to maintain round-the-clock operation. There can be little doubt that off-duty 80-wing staff would have spent some time in this Radlett hostelry. We will go inside and meet Radlett's own local historian, Philip Eastburn. It's very nice to meet you, Philip, uh, in, your, in your hometown. Village, village. Yeah, we like to call it a village. Oh, like yes. It, yes, this is do, Radlett, indeed. isn't it? This is Radlett. Now, yes. Can you tell us the place we're in? This is the the Cat and Fiddle. It's a local hostelry, um, looked after by Dom, our genial landlord, um, and almost certainly this pub would have been used by RAF personnel back in the 1940s. So the bean benders would have come in here. They would indeed. Catch storm. Uh, well, indeed. I mean, nobody knew anything about what was going on um, until 1990s. Um, there were RAF personnel around in Radnet, of course, um, hundreds of them, but um, nobody knew why they were here specifically. But there was a war on. Things were different, and there is an RAF station, what there was, about five miles down the road at Stanmore. So, why not have RAF people here as well? Now, um, we've just been inside the Cat and the Figgle and you've explained to us what that, the significance of that place. Now we've come out into their really nice garden. Lovely day, isn't it? And uh, we'd just like to get people who are watching this film to understand who you are, Phil. Oh, all right. Uh, my name is Philip Eastburn. Uh, people call me a local historian. Um, I'm very interested in the history of the village. I was born here a long, long time ago. Um, and back in the uh, early 1990s, uh, I found myself out of work. Uh, banks were shedding staff as quickly as they could then. And to fill in some time between jobs searching, I was in the local library, found one or two interesting books about the local community, local area. And through that developed an interest in local history, which has become my almost full-time passion you, uh, since. I understand what you said earlier that uh, you, are the, you are the database of the area. I do have a database. Um, I collect names from uh, Kelly's directories, um, census returns, electoral rolls, all sorts of places like that. Um, put them in my database and then if a name is mentioned I can look it up and find out something about them. Oh. It's, uh, it's all for personal interest but um, pleased if anybody else uh, has an interest in it as well. Now how did you get to know anything at all about 80 Wing, RAF 80 Wing? 80 Wing itself um, I knew nothing about until uh, Laurie Brettingham's book came out. And that's this book that's here? That's this book here, that's right. Um, I was already into uh, local history by that stage and um, Laurie came down to Radlett for a book signing. So I went along to it and um, met him and spoke to him explained I was a local historian and I spent a bit of time with him and he was telling me all the research that he'd done to find out about his book and of course he was telling me stuff that was absolutely unknown to me. I'm, I was born, born in Radley as I said and brought up here. My father was an air raid warden because he was too old for a, to be a serving officer and I recall that after the war I must have asked some questions at some stage about the RAF and what had happened in, in the village and he said that as far as he knew the um, uh, the old mansion at Newbury's had been used as a um, convalescent home for injured pilots. Convalescent so, home for injured pilots? That's right yes I mean that's why there were so many RAF personnel here and it sounded good to me so you know, for 60 years I believed him. So what changed then now? Uh, well obviously um, Laurie brought out all this information um, and since then I've been asking people a little bit and because people know me as a local historian uh, sometimes they'll phone me as did the gentleman uh, Dr. Simanowitz. He said did you know I've got um, an Anderson shelter in my garden? I said no I'd love to look at it. So I went up there and he told me that the house he now lived in 
had been um, used during the 40s as a minor injuries unit for the Air Force and there was a 42-seater Anderson shelter in his garden. 42 seats. Um, it's still there. Um, it's got electric light and water in it. I don't know whether that was there in 1940. Um, but there it is. And little bits of information like that um, come my way because people know I'm interested. Now, the, the other thing you told us was that you do get involved with the schools. I do indeed. What sort of things do you do in the school? Well, the local schools, a number of them, uh, seem to have, um, from time to time, um, a, a part of their programme of learning about the district, local knowledge. And they asked me to go and give them a, a talk about Radlett's role during World War II, uh, which I'm very pleased to do. And of course, none of them, none of the children have got any knowledge of what Radley did in, in, the, in the war, um, as neither have their, their teachers most of the time. But what is very interesting, that the first thing I have to tell these kids is to forget all their modern equipment, all their iPhones and iPads and pods, because um, I've got to talk to them about communication. Uh, even telephones in those days, as I say, were difficult. The best way if you wanted to get a message to somebody else was to send them a postcard. <laughs> they find that difficult to believe. But you did mention about this other uh, top secret thing going on in Radler. Oh, of course I tell them all about it. Um, and, uh, but that's why I need to tell them about the communications, all because right. um, um, the, uh, the RAF beam benders were reliant on the telephone and of course the um, the telephone number for Ordnham Lodge and Newbury's was London 1-2 and all the operators up and down the country were instructed to put a call through to that number when requested regardless of who they had to cut off to do it. Now that's interesting that, mm. that's really interesting. Now these two mansions were requisitioned during the war they but, were. But they, what's happened to them now? Well, unfortunately, um, as happened to so many of our beautiful old country houses, they got pulled down. Um, houses were built on their sites. Um, Newbury's was the first to go. Um, it was described in one of the history books of um, earlier this century, last century, pardon me, um, as the finest country gentleman's house in Hertfordshire. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, it certainly looks very nice from the outside. Um, that was pulled down in um, about the 1953, 1954. Aldenham Lodge, which was a hotel, managed to last another 10 years and was finally um, pulled down in the 1960s and houses built on the site. Aldenham Lodge was my favourite, partly because I knew it better, but partly because it had an outdoor swimming pool and um, a riding stables. So I spent uh, most of my formative years there. But now it's all housing. Old it's housing. not like uh, some places like Bentley Priory, which have now been re reconstituted how they were. That's right. In the war. Fortunately, um, places like Bentley Priory, they, they were not sold off somehow or other. They managed mm. to avoid the developer's eye and uh, have been, um, as you say, made into the places that they were, living museums perhaps. So. The only way we can we can tell what was in in that control room is not by going to see one, but by seeing the drawings in Lloyd Brettingham's book. That's right, um, and there aren't many people left alive now who um, will be able to remember them. I wouldn't think. Mm. Um, so we've got to rely on the memories of people who have put them down in print. There's nothing left to see in Radlett, unfortunately. Well, it's very kind of you to come and talk to us. That's uh, my pleasure, Philip. And we enjoy very much your company. And we hope you have a good day. Thank you very much indeed. I, I can't remember the war, but was it all worth it? You know, what does R.V. Jones say? Well, Dr. R.V. Jones in his book, and um, this is a picture of him on the back here, he, he had this to say. He said in his chapter on re recollections, so what difference had my attachment to intelligence made? Suppose that I had not been there, what would have happened? We should certainly have been slower with radio countermeasures and the bombing of our inland towns must have been worse, perhaps much worse. With our night fighters and guns powerless, radio countermeasures were our only means of defence. 
Not only could there have been many more Coventrys, but the German aim of knocking out our aero engine factories might have been achieved. Yeah, Coventry was a real casualty, and I've seen pictures of the devastation that was caused there. Um, but that was before the new ex Girac beam was fully understood, and the bromide jammer was not tuned properly to prevent that happening. We've got a special and local story here about Coventry Blitz. In the 1980s, I got to know Charlie Brooks, who built Hillside Bungalow near the old reformatory site. And he told me that on a November night in 1940, he couldn't sleep and he wandered out onto the high rocks in the fields nearby. It was bright moonlight and he could see a terrible red glow on the horizon. And meant that meant to him that Coventry was ablaze under a night long Luftwaffe blitz. I asked him how that made him feel and he said he felt totally helpless knowing that homes and lives were being destroyed and he could do nothing about it. He said he felt terribly guilty, but he had to go to bed and return to his normal life. But he couldn't do that for hours after he sat watching that sight on the horizon. And he thought of all those who are now without homes, and mothers or fathers and children. Charlie Brooks' tearful words as he thought about the destruction being wrought on Coventry, away there on the horizon. Derby did not have to endure a Coventry-style raid. In the whole war, the Rolls-Royce aero engine factories in Derby only received this one bomb on a stores building. It was delivered by a lone bomber not using target beams, flying at 200 feet and using well-rehearsed Dead Reckoning navigation. Back at the German cemetery at Cannock, the widow and son of Luftwaffe casualty Otto Paul came to visit in 1967. As they made the journey here to Cannock, they were forever grateful to the Bridport engineer Alf Staples, who took the story to them of Otto's crash on that beach in 1940. That crash, caused by 80 Wings beam bending activity, also revealed the vital evidence of how to properly tune our bromide jammers. One of the many chapters in the Battle of the Beams. Otto Paul, the Luftwaffe navigator, is remembered at Cannock with a headstone. Back in our Charlie 80 wing field, we are about to install our own stone. It came on a lorry which just managed to squeeze through the gate into the field. And so all was made ready to lift the three and a half ton lump of granite which had been taken out of the quarry face at Barden. And soon, with lots of ingenuity, the stone is finally settling into place and Charlie's chairperson, Maureen Havers, shows everybody's excitement. Well, Maureen, what's this piece of stone you're standing next to? Well, this is going to be our information point to tell the public who go past about the beam vendor site over there. How, how are we going to do that? We're going to have, um, this was kindly donated by Barden Quarry with the help of the people who work there and hauliers who've hauled it for us. It's got a nice flat face and we're going to have a lovely information plaque on there with the details of RAF 80 wing and what this site was used for in World War II. Are you pleased with it? I'm delighted with it. I love stone. Mm. This is local stone, granite. This is what Charlie's built on, is granite, the volcanic stone. So um, yeah, lovely bit. I'd like it in my garden. Do you think it'll stand up? It will. We're going to have a bit of safety precautions. We're going to put some concrete around it. Um, I don't think people are going to move this in a hurry. It'll stand here now for 100 years. That stood there for 70 years. So this will outlast it. So the next thing is when we put the plaque on. 
Yes, and then we'll have a proper opening ceremony and hopefully we'll get Ken Nichols down, who worked on the site, we'll get him down to perform the opening ceremony. You're in here, Ken, that's your, your stick bike. Right, Terry? Got Ken? Okay, Ken. Okay. You can turn around to face the camera. This occasion has only made been made possible due to the research and dedication of the Charlie Heritage Group. Without it, the 80 wing activities during war years 1941 to 1943 in the Char Charlie district would have been lost forever. This outstation transmitter Transmitter's purpose, one of many in England, was to counter German bombers' navigational signals and divert them from their targets. This was known as beam bending, a phrase which I understand was given to the, by the Germans and provided successful protection for Leicester, Nottingham and Derby, the areas covered by the Charlie outstation of 80 Wing and controlled by RAF 80 Wing headquarters from Radlett. On behalf of the Charlie Heritage Group, it gives me great pleasure as possibly the last person who served here still standing, although with a great deal of difficulty, to unveil this dedication in memory of all those from 80 Wing who served at the Oaks Charlie. Thank you. Now the thing is, have I got the strength? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, well done. Well done. Well done. We gave Ken Nichols one last task to perform. By this gate, a new cherry tree had been planted in memory of where Ken first met his future wife. Ken made a most poignant speech. I would like to thank Maureen for arranging this memory to my first meeting with my wife, Iris, over 72 years ago. We met under a cherry tree. This is long gone, but now to be replaced at the gate of my RAF site on Abbey Road, Oaks in Charnwood. Iris was 15 going on 20 when I met her. I was a young lad of 19. We lived a happy life of 64 years together after our marriage in 1945. And Iris was still, was and still is the love of my life. I, I join in the planting of this cherry tree in her memory. Thank you, God, for Iris. Thank you, God, for Iris and Ken. Yes, thank you.